This is so very wrong about games. It is a board gaming podcast about board games. My name is Michael Walker, and I'm here with my good friend, Mark Bigney. How are you today, Mark? I'm very well, Walker. I am in Kingston. I'm here physically with you. Like here? Yes. We're, we're face to face. I mean, I've always been here, but now I'm, I'm, I'm here. Here, here. Yeah. And this is going to be permanent very soon. This is just going to be a little <laughs> yeah, but not yet. layover, but soon enough. My entire life has been a layover for 13 solid months. Nothing but 13 months of layovers. Enough about pain and suffering. It's like I'm in the Delta Terminal for my entire life. <laughs> it's so true. One it's like star a, would not recommend. Tom Hanks movie. All right. We are going to talk about the game we reviewed exactly one year ago. The games we played this week and then on to the news and why it doesn't matter. And then the topic of the week, which is... A long-awaited return to our intermittent designer spotlights. We're going to be talking about David Thompson. I am looking forward to that. Mark, we played a very interesting game one year ago. No, we didn't. Stop lying to these fine people, Walker. It is Fort by Leader Games. It had the same, they had just come out with a huge hit, Root. Yes. Then they came out with another game using the exact same art. Kyle, well, same artist. Same Kyle artist. Farron. They were not anthropomorphic animals. These were children. True, true enough. Same sort of uh, uh, design. Oh, absolutely. Feel. It was still unmistakably Kyle Farron art. Yes. So true. So I'm wondering, it, it definitely got a lot of hype. And I'm wondering if 90% of that was because of the art. Yeah. So the, I think there are a couple of cynical explanations for what happened with Fort. I, I I personally don't think later games has much of a track record. Other than Root, I think most of their designs have been, uh, quite frankly, lacking. And I, I kind of saw... This is, this is incredibly uncharitable, all right? But I couldn't help but wonder if a whole bunch of people on the heels of Root were trying to convince themselves that Fort was better than it was. I don't know. No, I've definitely seen that before, and and theme, I've done it myself. It's not course. only the art; the theme was amazing. The theme was great. Getting your friends together, you know, big yard fight, chucking stones. The two currencies being pizza and toys. Pizza and toys. The component quality, everything about it looked like it was going to be great, but the gameplay definitely did not pan out. There was not. It, it sort of played itself as a deck builder, but you didn't really get a chance to build your deck. You're constantly throwing away cards, and it was basically a game where your deck churned itself more or less automatically, rather than a deck builder. If that yeah. makes any sense. It was odd. It <laughs> it was odd. And I haven't even really thought about it since. I haven't had cause to think about it. People don't talk about it, at least not in my circles. I'm not saying that people aren't playing it. But I haven't really been exposed to more people talking about Fort. And once we were done reviewing it, it was pretty much chucked into the memory bin. True. I, I do have it here. I do want to return to it the once because there has been an expansion. And I just want to play it with the expansion just just because. All right. <laughs> uh, be sure to do that the next few weeks while I'm still in Revere. Will do. And that was Fort by Grant Rodiak, put up by Later Games in 2020. Now on to the games we played this week. Walker, what did you play this week? Emphasis on we, Mark. Yeah. So let's start off with Contra the Board Game. This is designed by Adam Sadler and Brady Sadler, the Sadler brothers, also put out by their normal Blacklist games. One of the last games that they will do together, unfortunately. And this is more of the same from them, but highly distilled down to the very basics. Your... You're gaining skill tokens through various methods, and you're spending those skill tokens, uh, balancing those skill tokens between using them for abilities and be saving your life from dying. And this is goes through all their games, like Hour of Need and and uh, Street Masters, Street Masters, and, and most of all their, the modular deck systems. Most games. of their library, library, yes. Some version of Focus or Heroism or something or or Defense tokens, yes. And I had a great time playing it. It was very, very punishing. We did win, which was not to my liking. You know, the very first time I played a co-op game winning, well, you know, it was hard fought. There was a lot of deaths. Some of us were very close to losing the game. So it was like right down to the wire. So you're picking a boss. There are a bunch of henchmen out on the board and you sort of have to balance yourself between keeping the henchmen a little bit low so they don't overwhelm you and then hitting the boss because it's hitting you with devastating abilities right off the start. And... I had a great time. It falls into that same problem that we talked about with games like G.I. Joe and or Transformers, where you could you felt that it was a game designed for people that knew the IP, but didn't necessarily uh, were heavy into board games. And just like all of those other games, the rulebook did not reflect that. 
I agree. It's strange. It's tough for me to tell because I'm so immersed in the modular deck system games. But lately, I've been feeling that their rule books have been subpar. Uh, this was especially true, I think, of Ultra Quest. Understandably, because Ultra Quest is by far the most complicated of all those games. But even though Contra, the board game, is much simpler, I sometimes had a little bit of confusion about this, that, or the other. And, and same thing with Hour of Need, uh, which I mentioned for no reason whatsoever. There are weird corner cases that I still have difficulty internalizing. I don't know if this is just because I've played Street Masters so much and the other modular deck system games that the differences are getting smoothed out in my head, so I'm, I'm psyching myself out. I often have this problem with deck builders. You know, you play another deck builder, and you start to forget, wait a minute, is this one of those games where I can hold cards in my hand at the end of my turn, or I have to discard them? Is this one of those games where the card goes straight into my deck when I buy it, or to the discard pile? M minor details like that. But... That having been said, I found the rulebooks to be somewhat lacking, and I really... Th this was sold prematurely by Barnes & Noble, and they've actually restocked it since then. <laughs> prematurely, uh, the, the saying goes, Blacklist cannot catch a break. And I agree with you, if you're not a board gamer, if you're not a hobbyist gamer, and you really have enthusiasm for Contra, and you figure, oh, I want to play this run-and-gun tie-in, I, I think some people might be apt to be disappointed. I, I wouldn't say disappointed by the game itself, disappointed in trying to figure it out. Yes, because I think the game itself very much sort of grasps the feel of Contra as best as a board game can. I agree. You're, you're zooming around, you're picking up weapons, they're improving your fighting. Very, every, everything moves very smoothly if you know the rules. The one hit kill alone, I think, adds considerably to the feeling of playing Contra. It's a, it's a nice little hat tip on top of the fact that the weapons are all reminiscent of the Contra experience. And of course, it features Contra's best character of all time, Wall. Wall. And the, the tough boss that wall. <laughs> it's so true. And the and the cards are so overpowering. I loved everyone. It's like <laughs> it's like now it's my turn to be the hero. You play this like ridiculous card that lets everyone attack and Anyway. I mean, it does. Uh, so th that's one of the aspects that's interesting. I could talk for hours about the modular deck systems and the differences. I really do find the evolution and sometimes the evolution of the system really interesting. In Contra, there's no way to mess with the fundamental action economy of the game. You move once, you attack once on your turn, and then you play as many cards as you like. How do you draw more cards? Well, you, you draw cards when a card tells you to, or you draw one at the end of your turn. There's no way to spend actions to draw more. You asked after that, actually, because the cards are so useful. And as a consequence, it's all about the cards, and many of the cards are utterly ridiculous. Like, move 23 spaces, deal 17 damage, and tell three other commandos to have 17 tokens added to their supply. I exaggerate slightly. And so... It, you know, that's that's how the simplicity goes in. That's where you, you build in a more streamlined experience. As a consequence, though, you feel a little bit more at the mercy of the card play, and there's a little bit less interest in terms of the fundamental action economy of the game of Contra. But that's okay. I, I think it's probably the simplest and most straightforward of all the modular deck system games, and that's all right. So let's go from something that used the theme very well to something that I felt in the one game that I played did not. And this is, like you said, Hour of Need, also designed by the Sadler Brothers, also put out by Blacklist Games, also using this deck system. And it has a lot of fiddly bits to it, I feel. It's, it goes the other way. It goes from very basic and, and streamlined to a little more elaborate than the other games. Like, if you want, it, it's definitely a more advanced type system than, than what I've played before for that system. And it has this fiddly... Really? Even more so than Street Masters? I felt so. Okay. And... In the game we played, I've, I felt the movement was arbitrary because there were so many cards that let you move wherever you wanted. It had this fiddly system of of these close-ups of the different buildings and were they adjacent to the spaces where you could enter or you could not enter. And there was cards that let you just move from building to building. So the so the the board movement seemed very arbitrary to me that you could get almost anywhere you wanted at any time. But like I said, it was one play. I definitely want to try it again because everyone says that that particular session that we had wasn't up to its normal standard. I played twice that day, actually. Once with you and Huey, and once with Huey and Louie. And the one with Huey and Louie was vastly better. I enjoyed the session I had with you. And I, I, I'm quite mystified, actually, by your comments about movement. Because I, that's one of the ways in which I think Hour of Need is, in some aspects, the best of the modular deck system thus far. Because movement is very important but it doesn't consume the overwhelming focus of the game. That's one of the things I had against Brook City. Brook City was almost exclusively a game about getting from point A to point B. I had to get into a car, use this car, change vehicles, get over the bridge, and get all the way down. So, oh, great, now a problem is spawned to the north of the city. Ugh, 17 spaces away here. This time, listeners, I'm not exaggerating. 17 is the kind of distance.
distance you might be expected to traverse in a game of Brook City. What you're referring to is that some cards you play, indeed, allow you to travel anywhere you want on the map. But that, I think, is actually one of the few ways in which it feels like a superhero game. You're rescuing bystanders, you're dealing, you're knocking out three minions with a single punch, and sometimes you're just teleporting from one edge of the map to the other using some method of boosted speed, depending on, on what hero you have. I do agree with you that I'm not, I'm still not, and this is mostly my fault. Again, I don't know whether it's the fault of the rulebook or the game or me. I do see questions pop up on Board Game Geek all the time, so I'm not alone at least about the whole issue about how these issue spaces interact with the rest of the map. It does, this distinction, there, there are these zoomed-in issue spaces that aren't really on the map that are connected to the map in ways that are sometimes clear and sometimes not clear. They leverage that for some interesting effects. It allows you to have captured bystanders who are kind of off in a corner and you know that you have to do something different to rescue them. And it means that the map can have a whole lot of minions without getting cluttered because minions show up exclusively in the scheme spaces and they just pile up there. So it's not to no effect. I think that there could have been a better way to express it. And I'm really going to need to look over those sections and really remember, maybe even draw up my own player aid. But I'm I, I'm glad you're at least willing to try it again, because as I say, Hour of Need is probably my second favorite modular deck system game after Street Masters. With more plays and with more solidity in terms of my understanding of things, it might be my preferred version, because I really do like, again, con- con- uh, contrasting it with Contra, the way it deals with the action economy. You've got two actions on your turn, do whatever you want with those actions, as opposed to Street Masters, where you always have people that saying, like, okay, I've done my move, I haven't done my action yet, what can I do with an action, as opposed to my card play? Can I use my action to do a card play or my card play to do an action? No. So it's more restrictive in that sense. And so I, I think it's it's the nice balance between the just play cards for free of Contra versus the very restrictive card play system of some of the other modular deck systems. And to compare to Ultra Quest, in Ultra Quest, the cards almost fade into the background. It's mostly just your hero and their equipment cards. Anyway, as I said, I could talk forever about the modular tech system games. I'm glad you're willing to try it again. Sorry you didn't like your your first experience. No, oh, I mean, like I said, I'm sure everyone enjoys it. I love Sentinels of the Multiverse so much, I'm sure, with a different combination. And it was also my hero. My hero was a little fiddly for my very first time, for sure. Your hero certainly didn't seem to jive with you. Now, I, I don't know. It could just be that the hero was just a little too uh, daunting for a first play. It could also just be a personality thing, because sometimes... In games with this level of asymmetry, it's sometimes just a bad personality fit. I'm not going to say there's the same level of personality asymmetry as there is in a game of, say, Spirit Island, where it very much is the case that people take to certain spirits or bounce off of certain spirits very hard. But there's a certain degree of that in games of Alter- in, in games of Hour of Need. True, my character mostly focused on me manipulating my own deck and therefore not, you know I mean, I... I enjoy games more where I'm interacting with the other players on the board as, oppo- as opposed to, anyway. And again, some people really yes, like having, exactly. you know, yeah. these are my components, I'm fiddling around with them, this yeah. is how I'm going to help the team, whatever. One thing I will point out, though, in terms of Sentinels of the Multiverse, and we, Huey and I had a brief discussion about this, it's telling that in Sentinels of the Multiverse, Wraith is no longer referred to as not Batman. Wraith is Wraith. Wraith is her own person, as opposed to Hour of Need, where it's still very much, and I don't think this is ever going to change, no matter how much we play, because it's just not as fleshed out as much. Uh, there is a character who is very much not Batman. She will always be not Batman, I think. Agreed. So a lot less personality than Sentinels of the Multiverse, that's for sure. And that is Hour of Need by Adam and Brady Sadler by Blacklist Games. Next, let's move to Paint the Roses, designed by Ben Goldman, published by... I've forgotten. I've forgotten, too. It's it's a shame. They didn't put their name anywhere on any of the components of the game. They should have just printed it on the back of every tile. Oh, they wouldn't do that. That's gauche. That's silly. That would be silly. Putting putting their name on the back of every comp- every tile in the game would be kind of silly. They wouldn't do that. They wouldn't do that. North Star Games wouldn't do that. Oh, wait, that's it. North Star Games. Oh, you don't say. I do. So in Paint the Roses, we've talked about it before. This is the first time Mark has got to touch the actual components, play with the real game itself. You are, it's a very puzzly game. You, everyone has a secret card of a different combination of colors or shapes. And then someone's playing a tile and you're putting cubes down and telling the other players how many of the of the new tile combos with your card. And through this information, you are figuring out what cards everyone has. 
Paint the Roses is a blast. I, I really like co-op deduction games. Private deduction games I don't like because you just spend a whole bunch of time. Well, one of the reasons why I don't like them, I don't dislike them all as a matter of course, but one aspect that I disapprove of is you spend a lot of time just with your private notes trying to puzzle something out like you're studying for the LSATs. Here, at least, it's a more collective, collaborative endeavor, and you feel like you're not studying for a test, but actually solving a cool puzzle with the rest of your friends. And indeed, you can, in a game of Paint the Roses, you're, you're encouraged, I think, by just the dynamics of the game to listen to the speculation of your friends and make your plays accordingly so as to clue them into where they're going. I, I think that Paint the Roses is a marvelously accessible design as far as deduction games go. The components are delightful. The theme is utterly whimsical and appropriate. And I think that the balancing has been gotten pretty close to perfect. Every time I've played, and it's been about two or three times now before this, it always seems like it goes down to the wire. And I'm really bad at games like this, so usually the wire comes down to a guess <laughs> where we've narrowed it down to a one in three shot or something. With better players, I'm sure you could get a better success rate. But when I'm at the table, good luck with that. And there's a huge decision space, right? There is, why did the player play there and not over somewhere else? Why did they play there and not place any cubes? Or, you know, the last... Anyway, so many different ways you can play it. So much metagame once you get into it, which I hope I don't get too heavy into it because I, that be, when it becomes less fun, where it becomes more chance and more sort of taking the <laughs> risk, you know, making the guesses. That's what I always Well, it's interesting it. because, again, at the same table, we had two players playing the cooperative game together with radically different approaches. Huey was taking almost meticulous notes. You were taking no notes. You would assist occasionally with the note-taking, but that clearly wasn't your focus. Your focus was more on deduction by inference based on plays not taken. I, I remember in particular very early on in the game, I laid out a tile, and in the, in the process of laying out the tile, I indicated that I had made no matches with my card. And you then looked at the available supply of tiles that I didn't take, and then immediately correctly guessed what I had by virtue of that. And plays like that, and induction like that, and the fact that you can have different styles with respect to managing the information flow, I really think is a sign of how accessible and approachable Paint the Roses is. And it's it's just delightful. I think that this should be introduced to lots and lots of non-gamers, non-hobbyist gamers, that is. And I think this should get a, a lot of mileage because I think they, they really did a stellar job with the, with the production of the game itself. And we haven't even touched any of the many scenarios yet. And if they're any good at all in terms of just mixing up the base formula, I think that'll provide a lot of longevity. So let's go on to a game that we talked about that gave us the same feel as Paint the Roses. And this is Sniper Elite, the board game designed by some guy. I don't know. I think it's his first design. I've never heard of him. In conjunction with Roger Tankersley. It's true. And this is published by Rebellion Unplugged. So it's based off, it says the board game because this is based off a video game. And I think the, the less we say about the video game, the better. Well, I, I do want to comment because there were a couple of things leading into trying Sniper Elite the board game, which is a review copy we got from the publisher, that I had some misgivings. One of them was its connection with Sniper Elite because it's available on Game Pass, so I was able to pay, play it for free. I played about 20 minutes and I gave up because I found the, the, the violence in the game ghoulish. I've been playing video games for about 30 years and I can count on the fingers of one hand the number of times I bounced off a game because I thought the violence made me uncomfortable. I don't know who the slow motion x-ray kills are for in Sniper Elite, but honestly, it's the kind of thing that I would expect more in a satire, like an anti-war game, like Spec Ops The Line. It's like, oh, you think you're supposed to, you're here to have fun? This is what you're doing. But I don't think that's what it was trying to do. That was one misgiving. Another misgiving was that it's a 1v all game, and 1v all games we tend not to enjoy as much. And number two, another misgiving was that it's a fixed player count game. Namely, there's always going to be three squads of Germans and one sniper. So in theory, by default, it's a four player game. And since we often play with three, games with that fixed player count are often problematic. Well, I've never played the video game, and I'm not so great about the close up slow mo, you know, bullet shots. But then when I heard that when you zoom in on your target, a bio comes up. A little bit of biographical information about the person you are about to kill so as to humanize and personalize your target before you get the exquisite slow motion shot, their musculature and skeletal structure shattering under your rifle round. It, it, as I say, it, I found it ghoulish. I, re I literally couldn't believe it. it yeah, it it, is. It's, it's strange. I seriously, I'm not 100% sure it's not supposed to be satire. Like, that's how, that's how weird it is anyway. 
Because I think I've commented before that I, like we've been asked, like, what do you think about, you know, World War II games and, and the brutality and the humanity of it all? And it's like, well, you know, they're just, they're just soldiers. And, you know, once you get through, you know, you're not getting the backstory. You're not killing a father of three. They're, they're, you know, it's war. Right. You know, you're Abs- fighting for your country. Abstract, abstraction. Exactly. Abstraction is sometimes the route to dehumanization and abstract abstraction is sometimes the route to humanization. It's the other thing we always say on the show, context matters. And... So it was with all this baggage that we approached Sniper Elite, the board game. And I'm sure we'll talk about more of this later, but he's taking this genre and like David Thompson does, he just makes it. Namely the hidden movement genre. Hidden movement genre and just makes it better because there's always that question about, you know, line of sight and the pressure it puts on that one player about if they just make one mistake, then um, the whole game is ruined. But potentially, right? You can, right. you might be able to backtrack it a bit and fix it, but it's still the the flow and the feel of the game would be tarnished, right? So, and this takes it right out because it is very, I don't want to say simplistic because, you know, I don't want to like say it's, it's a simple game. It's simple. It's streamlined. It's very, there we go. It's very streamlined because they can only usually target the actual space that you're in and they have to be in that space. And so therefore it really reduces any chance of mistakes and it, Definitely does not take away from the gameplay whatsoever. In most hidden movement games that I've played, there have been thorny issues, as you say, about pathing, routing, line of sight, about various aspects of the map, and leading to confusion. And given that it is a very solitary experience playing the hidden character, because that's usually how it works, one hidden character against the rest of the table that is 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 openly collaborating and visible on the map, a simple rules mistake or a simple strategy mistake can cause the game to careen out of control. And that can be frustrating to either or both parties. We didn't have any of those issues at all in our experience with Sniper Elite. The, I, I just want to emphasize something. The map itself is utter genius. Because we were just looking at the different objective spaces that you might possibly pull in order to succeed in your objective in Sniper Elite. And just the, the, the avenues seemed perfectly calibrated. Just enough room so that the sniper has room to maneuver and possibly escape a net, but at the same time not so wide open that as the person chasing the sniper, you feel like there's no chance of ever discovering them. It seemed balanced on a knife edge, and indeed that's exactly how our game went down. It ended with only a couple turns left to go, and before the, the, the sniper was eventually caught. There were four metrics, and we talked about this after the game. There were four different things that happened over the course of a very simple, streamlined, hidden movement game. There were situations where the sniper had complete freedom of, freedom of movement, and we, as the person chasing them, ha- had no idea where he was. There were circumstances where there was a cordon, but he was clever, and so he slipped out of it. And then there were also situations where he, we knew exactly where he was and we needed to tighten the noose. And similarly, situations where we had to make clever inductions about where he was, so as to get, so we both got to feel clever at various times. And at the same time, we both got to operate completely in the dark at various times. And so we had this combination, both of mystery and elation. And it was, it was a marvelous experience. Yeah. And mostly in almost all hidden movement games, it's always a straight square grid and it's equal movement. This is very clever in the fact that when you're going down like main roads or main pathways, the space is a very long and thin, and that works out for both sides. One, if the sniper is trying to get away, they can move as fast as they want. And on the other side, if you're the Germans, you can use those long places to really block off his his movement, his intricate movement. And I thought that was very well done. You had a bit, uh, you expressed a bit of disappointment that the only way that the German hunters could do damage to the sniper was being in the same space. But I really think that that was a clever bit. So as to facilitate those bits with the map. So as to facilitate everyone. The assumption is that the sniper is always hiding. Wherever the sniper is, they're always hidden from sight, even if it's on a straight road. It's dark, they're behind a brush, they're in a ditch, whatever. And so you get that simplicity, that not having to worry about someone making an error in line of sight or what have you, because the line of sight rules are only relevant when the sniper is sniping. And so you don't have to constantly be like, wait, do I see, do I, do I see the points of contact are constrained and that minimizes mistakes and heightens tension. True. I, I thought it was mechanically very well done. I just thought thematically was sometimes Fair. odd when you like knew where he was and then someone like could come around. Anyway, I don't want to go too much into it because it's great just the way it is. I'm sure we'll talk more about it later. Yes. So let us move on to Scout. Scout is a card game designed by Kay Kajino and published by Oink Games. And it is a great little game, Mark. Easy to teach, easy to play. It's got a fantastic system where instead of uh, 
sort of mug, mulliganing your hand. Lots of games, you know, mulliganing your first hand. They've made this simply fix where you can take your whole hand and flip it around. And not only does it help you at the beginning of the game from making, because a lot of times you get euchred in your first hand. So this will help you fix it up. And when you acquire cards later on in the game, you can also flip them to the side that you want. So it gives you this, you know, way more flexibility. Very interesting thing happen. things happen. Lots of decision space because it's a game where uh, you have to beat the hand, the cards that were just placed in front of you, but there's a choice there. It's like, well, that's only a single card. I've got a ton of cards. If I win, I'm only going to collect one card. Why don't I just, you know, pass on this or, or scoop it up and wait until someone plays a bigger hand because my bigger hand is going to be way better. And then I'll be able to scoop five or six cards, that kind of thing. I love, but then Oops, I waited too long. The round's over. I was about to say, because you might wait. <laughs> oh, 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 because there's a huge incentive to try to get rid of all your cards. Cause then you're definitely not going to get negative points, but everyone else will get negative points based on how many cards they have left over. I don't know. Has almost all the things I like in card games. I like tempo considerations. I like not beating a set when you could beat a set, right? The decision to retreat or to, in this case, you say pass or scout, even though you could theoretically beat what's on the table. Decisions like that are, are, are often the things that I think that elevate a simple, clever idea into a fully fleshed out game. And scouts, scouts a joy. I love scout. Yeah. And there's one other quick mechanism. It's like, almost like another rule fix, just like flipping your cards around. It's a token that you get to use once per game. I shouldn't say game because you put once per once round. Once per hand, yeah. Once per hand, once per round, uh, which lets you scout a card and play a hand, which really helps if someone lucks out and gets a huge hand or, or opens up a, a punch more decision space, which is great. Nominated for the Spiel des Jahres. I hope it wins. It probably won't. Then, Hidden Leaders, which was a review copy. Sorry, I'm like opening up every game. We just, we just played them all together. You know, I'm just saying them all in a row. Sorry. Once again, you're bullying me. I never get to say what I want I, to say on this true. podcast. So, Hidden Leaders, which was a review copy put out by BFF Games. And another great little card game. You, There are four different factions, and they all have a distinct winning condition only one of them can win you have only two tokens on this track and in turn order everyone's playing a card to move these two tokens up and down the track and depending where they end up at the end of the game is going to tell you which faction won the game then you're going to flip over your leader cards and if they supported that faction then you have a chance to win you add up how many cards of that faction you played and whoever has the most cards is the winner i came into hidden leaders with with no expectations whatsoever and I was very pleasantly surprised. At worst, these are the two things about Hidden Leaders that are a joy. One of them is the artwork is fabulous. Top you have, notch. You have this host of unique characters, and they have very clever or funny names, like the well-shaved wizard or the unconfident executioner, and just so much personality in every p picture or portrait. So frequently after we play a card, we insist... Everybody, everybody else at the table needs to see this. And we tell little stories about what this character was doing and why. Absolutely beautiful. Such personality. You know, on the level of Kyle Farron's production in terms of imbuing simple drawings with so much personality. Not the same art style, but the, the same level of personality and charisma in these characters. And number two, you don't know which faction is going to win until the very end of the game. It... There's a lot of tension in that sense, a sense of drama, a sense of development. Now, the game can end abruptly as a consequence. I'm not sure how much control there is in Hidden Leaders. And that's why I say, at worst, you have charming characters in a, in a game where there's a bit of a roller coaster and there's some tension. As to how much influence I have about what, whether my choices are consequential in a game of Hidden Leaders, I'm genuinely not certain, but I'm happily willing to try some more to find out. Yeah, and the interesting part is because you can sort of flip-flop. Your your leader has two different factions that they're backing. So you can say, okay, well, I'm going to try to go to the undead faction. So you play a card at the beginning of the game always to go with your leader and it sort of starts you on the on the road to that faction. But halfway through the game, you can say, oh, that, that's not going to happen. And you can suddenly, you know, switch over to the other faction and hopefully get enough cards out to win. So I was also worried that the victory conditions of the various factions were going to be a little bit obtuse because there are lots of simple games where the end game's condition, end game conditions are obtuse or even more complex games where the end game condition is obtuse. Wait a minute, wait a minute. So, so red is higher than green, but it's lower than black and we're in the light side of the track. Okay. This means that we have this end condition or what have you. 
and it can just break your head. Here, five minutes into the first game, I immediately understood what the stakes and consequences were of every shift of the track. And so you had four different possible end conditions, but it was all perfectly transparent how they worked. Yeah, and the designer, the artist's name is Satoshi Matsura, just because we talk so much about the art. Thought it was important. Designed by Andreas Muller, Marcus Muller, and Raphael Stalker. Hidden Leaders. We got to play Foundations of Rome, which is a ridiculously overproduced game. I already talked about it, but I was lucky enough to be able to show this to Mark. It was designed by Emerson Masucci and published by Arcane Wonders. And like I said before, everything I wanted Big City to be. It's you're, you're buying these cards as they slide along a track and get cheaper, which gives you plots of land. And then you're playing these Tetris shaped buildings that totally combo off each other. You can see that someone's comboing too much. And if you're lucky enough to get uh, a bigger building that you can place, you can switch what your building was that they don't combo off it anymore. You're getting these cool monuments off to the side that give you even more scoring. Every round there's like a sort of scoring get income. It has this great a uh, system where you either have too many of your tokens out marking your places so you can't take a plot that you really need or you don't have a, enough money to take the plot that you need so you have to spend a turn either building a building or spend a turn getting money all of those decisions really great mark what did you think of foundations of rome it was i if it was with tokens i don't know that i'd play it and quite frankly i don't know that <laughs> The market can continue to justify this much plastic for no real purpose. I mean, yeah, the pieces were gorgeous. Really, really beautiful. And at the end of the day, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm getting to the point in the hobby now, in the point of my hobbyist life cycle, where I play a game like Foundations of Rome and it's like, yeah, it's, it's amusing, it's fine. And then I wonder, could this work 100% as well with cardboard tokens? The answer being yes. And I'm like, so what are we doing here? And I just, I, I realize, I realize this is fully hypocritical. I, I realize that there are lots of games where I'm still like, yay, the miniatures. But I've said before, miniatures sometimes are practical as well as cosmetic. Here they were entirely cosmetic. Yeah, but over the top cosmetic. Like we've, yeah, we they played, were really nice. We played games like this before, like Big City, yes. huge clunky, you know, like houses. I uh, like them, but yeah, they're not but, at the same level. Yeah, the er or era, which is a great sort of roll and write type, you know, punch your walls and sure, but those were those were tiny. They're they're tiny, but even so, they're sort of like you know, melt. They're not. They're very basic and sort of didn't the have melty. the same level of crisp yeah. detail. Yes, yeah, these they're so nice, over the top. Yeah, it, it was all right. It, it's basically you know a more gamerly version of bingo. And you know, letters come up. You hope to snatch the letters that are better than the other letters. I, I found the building restrictions actually la slightly more constricting than I would have liked because of the paucity of shapes that you had available to you. And again, I understand you when everything is going to be a ridiculously sculpted miniature, you can't throw around and have lots of weird different buildings, although you can in the context of the monuments. But in terms of player boards, you know, the number of times where it's like, ooh, that's obviously going to be building shape. Oh, wait, no, it's not a building shape. All that I have are straight lines, a right angle, and two by two squares. That's it. No standard Tetris pieces. No, <laughs> like we, we were very frequently, even people who played the game before, it's like, there are no crosses. Oh yeah, there are no crosses. There are no zigzags. All right. No T's. No T's. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. So this is what we're doing. It was fine. I, I look, I'd play it again. I just, I don't know, man, 150 bucks for this. I just, this I'm, is me I'm, getting yeah, cynical. Yeah. I'm glad someone else bought it. Yeah, How's that? Go. There you go. I think this is an excellent game for Warm Boy to have. Yes. <laughs> exactly. I suggest that you get your Warm Boy to pick up a copy. <laughs> and some of the modules seem very interesting as well. The one that lets you play around with the plots of land has some promise. I, I would, I'm half intrigued by the, the prospect of the version where you can trade plots of land, a la Chinatown, at which point it becomes very, very much like Chinatown. In point of fact, almost identical to Chinatown in a number of ways. I'm worried about how long it would be because it was a fine length with the four of us. It was somewhere around 75 to 90 minutes, which is fine for a game of, of, of this depth. With trading, that would probably balloon to at least two hours. I don't think even with trading, Foundations of Rome could justify that play length, but I'm curious. I also got to show Mark a new game called Stroganoff. I've talked about it before, but I got to introduce it to Mark. This is designed by Andrea Stedding and published by Game Brewer, of which we received a review copy of <laughs> from Lion Rampant. So, Mark, I just, I, I'll just let you, I've already talked about it. What do you think of Stroganoff? 
I was surprised by how clean it was because I was honestly intimidated by the rulebook. The rulebook does a thing, and I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna re- record uh, a bit on this on the next episode of Bloat because the rulebook does a very, very bad job at keying you in to what you need to remember and what you don't need to remember. Because you read the rule book and it says, okay, you can do two actions in your turn. These are constraints of how you do an action. I'm like, all right, I'm there. It's like, and this is the list of actions you can do. And it proceeds to list about 12 different things. I'm like, what, what, what? But in point of fact, as when you were explaining the game, just to remind me of what was going on, you're like, this shows you everything. And you pointed to a section of the board and then everything is fine. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the, you don't need any player aids. Everything's on the board. And it's not as though it takes away from the board presence. Not even remotely, yeah. Not even remotely. So every uh, the player aid's there, the end of round there, the end of game scoring is there. Everything's on the board. Easy to teach. Lots of stuff to do. Uh, you're uh, capturing Pokemon. This would be such a great Pokemon retheme. Oh my goodness, you're right. I didn't, I didn't, want, I didn't want to spoil it because I was actually going to try it, but we'll see. <laughs> It'd be a perfect Pokemon retheme. It would, would be. Um, so yeah, so you're trying to advance into the wilderness. A lot of advantages if you're the furthest along. You're trying to sort of reduce the number of animals per area because that helps you sort of take that area. There's a set collection there. There is... I like the fact that it's very locked in. Every section has the animal you must use to get the most out of certain actions. It's an utterly arbitrary economy, but it works. It's like, oh, you're in this section of the board. You need to have fox pelts in order to take an extra action. Oh, oh, you moved a couple over? Not foxes anymore. Now you need mink. It's like, oh, oh, okay. But it works. Yeah, and it has uh, ongoing powers you can pick up, all sorts of different options. Every area has sort of like a yurt, a village, uh, a czar's wish card. Lots of things to do, lots of ways to get points. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I think the theming is atrocious. This is this was pointed actually in our uh, Patreon Discord, and it was also pointed out independently by Huey. Unlike the many, 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 many Euro games of the course of the past 30 years that lionize the terrible deeds done by Christopher Columbus and the, and the Conquistadors and a whole bunch of other colonialists, the Cossacks in their expansion into Siberia committed untold numbers of atrocities. And the Russian Empire in its expansion into that area of the world, as represented the game of Stroganov, it was basically a series of massacres and forced rendition and utterly nightmarish things. If anything, it's nice that we're finally getting this sort of hagiographic, hey, utterly inappropriate Euro theming for new areas of the world. There are monsters everywhere. <laughs> And we can whitewash all the monsters in every area of the world. This is pro- this, I guess, is what progress looks like. Let's make, except not. Let's make games about them. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Well, because again, the theming it kind of sort of hangs together, but it's ut- utterly arbitrary. I think the Pokemon theming would actually make more conceptual sense, and also wouldn't whitewash a terrible period of history. So, <laughs> agreed. Mark, we played a lot of games. We got to play Burn Cycle. So this is the newest game from Chip Theory Games, those of Too Many Bones and Cloud Spire, games that you can play in the bathtub (laughs) because they have a commitment or they have a quest. They want to use... Fixation? Fixation. Fish? A... Obsession. uh, Yes. (laughs) They want to be known for using chips. See, it's a Chip Theory mark. Oh. They're Chip Theory Games. Got it. I think I get it now. Lots of chips. Uh, all the cards are plastic. Everything is plastic. All no of, tokens. It's all neoprene. Yep. All yes. All the all the boards and and map sections are all neoprene. So this is what's going on in Burn Cycle. Once again, the human race has destroyed itself, and the robots are still alive. So the robots rebuild society, and they say, "Well, it's kind of lonely here." Let's bring back <laughs> the humans. So they genetically bring back the humans and say, here's this whole world we've rebuilt for you. And then they had a terrible idea where they said, well, we have some of these uploaded brains from these corporate leaders. Why don't we instill them in some of these new humans? Because that's a great idea. And guess what? It was not a great idea. Humans once again took over great corporations and, and you know, terrible things. And then they decide that the robots were too powerful, so they stole a key part of their their programming, and now it's broken up into all the different corporations. And we, as mercenary robots, must, oh, freedom fighter robots, freedom fighter robots, must break into these giant corporations and and retrieve our code. What the game promises is a bunch of heists. What it felt like was a series of escort missions. It seemed like a lot of busy work. That too. <laughs> 
plotting, ponderous, and here I'm here here I would like to complain about chip theory games. One of the things that I commented when playing the game with you is like I have my criticisms of Stonemeyer games. I actually think I like more Stonemeyer games than you do, because I enjoyed Pendulum, I enjoyed Red Rising, well certainly more than you did. But I'm I'm very thankful that Chip Theory Games doesn't have the kind of market influence that, say, Stonemeyer does. Because Stonemeyer puts out, comparatively, vastly more affordable products from a variety of different designers that at least play cleanly. Chip Theory Games, I think, I'm now solidly comfortable calling them a one-hit wonder. I like Too Many Bones. It has some problems, but I still enjoy the game. The other things I've tried from them are unfocused, unwieldy messes. And I think that For the first time in Burn Cycle, I can point to their fixation on their components and say, you have actually made a worse game because you are committed to these components. Cloud Spire, at least, we would say, why on earth did you make the terrain styles neoprene when you have to shuffle them? No human can shuffle neoprene. Can't be done. They're just floppy messes. They can't slide properly. It's just, why did you do that? That was silly. Here in Burn Cycle, they are committed to a certain grid size by virtue of their chips. They use this, these certain kind of chips. The grid has to be a certain amount of size. When you have a grid that coarse and every mission is an escort mission, you run into each other all the time. The number of times that we had weird turns where it's like, well, then I'm in your way. You can't in there because then you're in my way. But then there's this guard that's going to be in the way, not because of any sort of root- rooting pathing or any interesting consequences, because the, the board is so damn coarse. And honestly, it didn't feel... Like we were doing anything amusing other than just battering these endless move actions into the ground. And uh, it, it, it wants to be a SEAL Team Flex. It, but it's not SEAL Team Flex. Agreed. Makes me want to play SEAL Team Flex. <laughs> and like you said, they, because they don't use any tokens, everything has to be one of these giant chips. So yes. you, if you just want just like a sort of console or a door or a key or any of these things, they are these giant chips. And, and there's so many rules. Oh my goodness! There are so many rules, and mostly we just moved. That's what I'm. That's what I'm. That's my next point. It, it's it's. I love the story. I love the theme. Me too. I love the pit. I love the graphic design, like the pictures, like the, the art way, on the, the, the art of the robots and the enemies. I, I right. love, and yeah. the way the the map actually looks is is is. I like it eh, quite a bit. Sure. And the whole concept of breaking in and having different levels. But then when, like you said, when you get down to it after listening to all this gigantic explanation and this whole side game about going through the net, all you're doing on your turn is moving. Much of the time, yeah. There is a little bit of cleverness of trying to stay hidden and or out of the bot's way. But then in the end, we said, well, why don't we just punch them into nowhere? And so we did. And then People often complain in stealth games be they video games or board games or what have you, that there's no way to completely rid the map of guards. And there's a good reason for that. Because if you can just rid the map of guards, then there's no game anymore. We realized about halfway through the game, why are we spending so much time dodging the guards? Why don't we just kill them all? Because there's no respawning element. So we killed a couple guards, and then the game was just trivial. And then Burn Cycle was just really just wrestling with the core mechanics. I just need to move from point A to point B, man. Why won't you let me move from point A to point B? And they're like, no, 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 slow down. Have you fiddled with these 17 different components first? I'm like, ah. Yeah, it's like these great mechanisms to get you to basic moving, right? Yeah. It has this great Burn Cycle. That's what the, you know, guess what? That's the name of the game, right? Yeah, it is. Where, where you're going through these actions, and you can pay points to give yourself more actions, and you get to... F- uh, seed that board with with ability so when you do that type of ability it's better all of that fantastic and then so i can move better hooray <laughs> two extra movement points yep. yeah and then and then when your turn's done you have this uh whole sort of internal network thing you might have drawn some cards for that because you're sick of moving so you might as well pick up some network cards and yep. then you're spinning around this circle getting more stuff so you can move better yeah there is room here for quite a clever game. We th- we think that if you pared the, the, the main map down in terms of complexity by a significant factor and increased the number of ways that the network aspect interfaced with the physical world, you then have this weird sort of, well, we're robots, we're beings of both mechanisms and programming. And if there were more interfaces between those two aspects, then I think you could have a really clever game and you could have trade-offs between, well, this is better for the physical world, but it, but impedes my progress in the net or vice versa. I think that would be really cool. That's not what Burn Cycle was. This was a first play. Definitely going to play it some more. More power to you. Not sure when, exactly. But we're going to give it a try. Unless What's it dis- this we? Unless it disappears before I get a chance. What's this we, Walker? 
And oh, I'm not, I'm certainly not taking it anywhere. That's for sure. That thing weighs a ton. <laughs> I'm not even taking that to the next room. On the topic of can the hobby sustain this many hundred and fifty dollar board games? Ugh. Finally, for me, I played for sale. For sale, the venerable filler from Stefan Dora, originally published in the nineties. I miss. I kind of miss the era where every other game was an auction game. I really like auction games and I don't get to play them very much anymore. And for sale is absolutely the best filler auction game bar none. I think it is very flexible in terms of player count. It has got such delightful art. It was recently republished in a version by buying and selling cars. I don't think it's nearly as, as clever or as cute as the one where you're buying property all the way from the lowly cardboard box to the lofty space station. And I still haven't. I still also haven't tried the expansion module of the advisors. I'm somewhat dubious, but we'll see. But the base game by itself has stood up for over 20 years for a reason. It's a fabulous experience. We played it at the maximum player count of six, and it goes very quickly, very smoothly. The rules explanation takes five minutes, and you're off. And it has two different kinds of auctions. Marvelous game. It's probably my favorite filler game of all time. For sale is a marvelous game. It's almost. It's not. It's not just auctioning there's sort of like a gambling part to it because you're sort of because you know what is in the deck and you know what's going to come up and you know what's left and you're right gonna, and you're saying okay well i know those cards are out i know he's played those cards i, I can think what's going to be on the next one can i risk losing my highest card and then maybe you know luck out because the next draft is going to be all high so it doesn't matter what cards i have Wow, so good. And it teaches you about economics. In the right market environment, the cardboard box will sell for $5,000. And in the wrong market environment, the space station will only go for eight. Exactly. That's for sale by Stefan Dora. And those are the games we played this week. Now on to the news and why it doesn't matter. Well, this is a, a, a numeric five, Mark, where we talk about our Patreon because I don't like talking about it very much. And I, or I said long ago that every 10, I was going to talk about more stuff. So that's going to be a little bit of stuff. So Mark already talked about his bloat episodes. He puts great work into those. They're very interesting. It's something I actually listen to. Like, I don't listen to what Mark says when he's in front of me, but these <laughs> I actually listen to. We also do a Pledge of Indifference, where we talk about all the different Kickstarters and, and uh, GameFound, all the new uh, crowdfunding stuff. Lots of stuff going on. We have our own uh, Patreon Discord, which lots of stuff are going on where you can join games with other other listeners. We're there very frequently. That is all about the Patreon. Now I'm loading up to give away a whole bunch more games because I have access to some games that patrons have been asking for. True. Yeah, there's all sorts of different tiers. Tiers where you get free games. Tiers where you get stuff. Newsletters. All sorts of other stuff. The second thing I would like to talk about is the fact that now that the Board Game Geek Awards are done and the listeners have robbed me of our only chance to advertise out there because we cannot be nominated anymore. And sometimes people ask, well, what can we do? Well, things that you can do is like and subscribe our Facebook, our Twitter, Ugh, our stuff. I need to take a shower. I know, right? It's uh, awful. But this is the only outlet we have now, Mark, because they when it's done. took it away from us. Anyway, moving on. And, oh, good, and then right. emailing publishers. If you buy a game because you heard us talk about it, if you want to hear about a game, you want us to talk about a game, if you email publishers, the more people that hear about us, the more our name gets out there. We really don't like wasting your time, and we really don't like coming head in hand asking you to do things. But at the same time, we are immensely grateful for all the feedback we get, no matter what form that takes, even if it is just a function of your time by listening to the show. It's one of the reasons why... We don't spend every episode talking about yes. smash this button, hit that button, whatever. We don't like doing it. And why I feel very ill now. And you won't hear it about <laughs> it again for another 50 episodes. Yes. <laughs> anyway, but we thank you very much for your time, dear listeners. We thank you for your support. If you give us more support, thank you very much. All right, on to some actual news. Mark, Fantasy Realms got a big push a few months ago. So now Z-Man Games is going to do a Fantasy Realms deluxe edition do you like uh card sleeves mark please no too bad <laughs> comes with it automatically <laughs> okay comes with uh all of the promos and all of the stuff that you've heard about fantasy realms expansions everything else all comes in this new deluxe edition and it's the regular theme they didn't like it's not the star trek one it's not the star wars one it's just regular Fantasy Realms, Deluxe Edition, Z-Man Games. Arcs. We talked about 
leader games. Hopefully this will be another design that is good, much like Root. This is a, going to be a sci-fi sort of, I don't, don't want to say companion, uh, uh, campaign game because it really is it's sort of i think well, it, it's it, kind of sort of a campaign game they say it could be there's like just three games you can play yeah. in succession if you wish the more i hear about it the more intrigued i am because right from the start it was supposed to be you know a 60 to 90 minute game that you're supposed to play play a campaign of roughly three-ish games i'm like oh a campaign in, in in a single day i can get behind that and i keep hearing the same words describing the mechanisms trick taking like ooh, i get behind that Looks interesting. Same fabulous art. So everything I've seen so far, very interesting. Arcs by Cole Worley and Leader Games. It is on Kickstarter right now. Lastly from me, long ago, Mark, in the before times, I talked about Batman Gotham City Chronicles. <laughs> we tried to play Batman City. and then the, uh, I'm willing to say that we played. Not correctly, but we played. We did play. And the rule book was terrible. And then right almost immediately they talked about revising the rule book. Well, it's finally here. This is a rule book that was uh, designed, I guess, designed, written by Paul <laughs> Grogan. He has huge influence in the market. He has channels and videos and all sorts of stuff. So they're, they're on Kickstarter right now. This is, I guess, what they're calling it season three. It's uh, been paired with their Batman role-playing game. So there's all sorts of different things you can get. If you're interested in sort of, it, it uses the Conan system slash, uh, Civilization New Dawn system where not so much Civilization New Dawn because it gets more powerful. Well, this, similar, similar idea. Similar idea. There's a river and you are disincentivized from activating the same thing over and over. Correct. Yeah. The, to activate minions, it's free for the first one and then it gets more expensive as you go down the line. And then as soon as you activate those minions, they lift up and they move to the back and everything slides forward. One of the reasons why I got it. Very interesting because I never got a chance to play Conan, but the one play we did had some interesting stuff going on it was pretty rough with the, the map and the coloring of the map and, and the fact that you had to go to different weird spots in the rule book to figure out that this is an elevated spot and this isn't an elevated spot. Yeah. And lots of rough things. Uh, ton of symbology that was all over the rule book. This, the, I've read the thing. It comes like with 80 cards, like a, a, a skill sheet for every character. So now you're, oh, not, good. So you're not passing around the book. You get your, your, your character card and your skill cards. So it lists all your skills. Hopefully all of this is fixed. We will find out because I am pledged. So maybe oh in about three years when it fulfills, mm -hmm. you will once again hear about Batman City Chronicles. So I'll be hearing about it constantly for the next three years. No, I don't think so. Because it's not the actual. We have the game. I still have it sitting on the shelf. We can see it here. It's visible from space. It's not. Uh, I'm excited. I'm excited to read the rule book and see if it reinvigorates. And that is the news and why it doesn't matter. On to our feature topic this week, which is another designer spotlight on David Thompson. Yes. Walk He's a very famous Canadian. Did you know that, Mark? Born in 1770, he was a fur trader, no. a surveyor, a cartographer. No, these are, these are over his career, he traveled to over 90,000 kilometers. I, I don't even know that David Thompson he was, works he, in kilometers. He mapped over 4.9 million square kilometers of North, North America. Uh, okay. Did he design any games? No. Okay. Why, who are we talking about? We're talking about the game designer. He's more important than this guy? <laughs> <laughs> I, I I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> my, my experience with David Thompson and my reactions to David Thompson can actually be expressed through the subtleties of emphasis in the English language. Because I remember back in 2017... Uh, was the first time I, I heard about him. It was in the context of DVG's Kickstarter campaign for Pavlov's House, which is the first published game in the Valiant Defense series. And I thought, oh, who the hell is this guy? And so I, I, I passed on that. And then as I kept playing games by David Thompson, we went from who the hell is this guy to who the hell is this guy to who the hell is this guy? And now we're fully into emphasis on every word. Who the hell is this guy? <laughs> So true. So we started with War Chest. That was the first game we played by David Thompson. One of the things I think we should stress right off the bat, and this, based on his interviews and other comments he's made, David Thompson is among the first to emphasize almost all his published designs are collaborations with other authors. 
And despite the fact that we're going to be emphasizing on David Thompson, we're not necessarily implying that we know for a fact what input came in from David Thompson and what came in from other designers or what have you. So I don't want to give short shrift to any of his co-designers because that would be churlish and unfair. So the first game we played of his was War Chest, which he co-designed with Trevor Benjamin, one of his frequent collaborators, an expatriate Canadian for what it's worth. And what, what are your recollections of War Chest? Because it's been a while since we've played it. Well, War Chest... Uh, there's a game called The Duke, which I really enjoyed. I had I had uh, big feelings for it. Very interesting game. And this is what David Thompson does. He takes games like The Duke. I have no, it, this one. He had no idea. It has nothing to do with The Duke. I'm sure. Right, he, conceptually, you're just yeah, drawing had con- concept to, lines rather than exactly. historical lines. And, and what you what you do in The Duke is you, you're pulling tiles out of a out of a bag, and they're like chess pieces. And on that tile, it has what that specific tile can do. It's like uh, Oranami, if you know that game more than than other games and he's simplified that where it's not the luck of the draw you're not pulling out this i've got this killer tile and you're just pulling out crap you're it's a very basic set of chips and it's a area control and every different chip has its own way it can move its own way it can attack and we've i believe if i remember right we just didn't like how the end game sort of yeah triggered out it seemed to just be a, an attrition type thing but everything leading up to that was really good uh there's been two expansions for it which has said that it fi- you know maybe fixes that a little bit we shall see i have played it since we initially tried it shortly after publication because it's a beautiful production by whiz kids they came out chunky chips that actually are functional qv chip theory games and also economical qv chip theory games <laughs> And I loved the way the bag building worked. Sometimes there was a lot of luck of the draw because you're just pulling out three chips and sometimes you really need something to activate sooner. But yeah, the end game for us was always attritional. I'm told that if both players are really good or maybe if one of the players is really good, you're not going to see that. But quite frankly... Oh, we're not good enough. Well, I'm... uh, Insofar as there is an ability to get good, I'm not in a position to get good. And so rather than get good, I got rid of it. But <laughs> that was only our first experience with, with David Thompson design because the same collaboration, namely David Thompson and Trevor Benjamin, then came out with Osprey's breakout hit, Undaunted Normandy. So apparently this is uh, a, a design that he was working on like 15 years ago from playing a game called A Few Acres of Snow. He used this design to sort of you know, start off on a thing and then he came back to it. And yeah, designed... deck, deck building coupled with war gamey elements, yes. Exactly. And Unlock Normandy is, even to this day, one of my favorite war games. Nice, easy to teach, very, you know, deck building, uh, everything makes sense. Very little luck, a little bit of the dice rolling there sometimes. Yeah. Gets a little... Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes get a little rough, you know, sometimes it goes not my way as per usual in dice games, but still the interesting, you know, losing cards out of your deck for wounds, adding more cards in a deck for more activations and or staying power, tons of scenarios. The setup, I guess you could say, might be a little sometimes, yeah. A little long. But other than that, everything about Undaunted is fantastic. Undaunted, if you'll recall, was one of the first games we reviewed at the start of the pandemic. We were both in, well, I certainly was in a bad headspace with respect to gaming because everything was suddenly now on Tabletop Simulator. We had gone from being able to regularly see each other and play games to to everything being laborious and painful and time-consuming. And my thought was, you know what's just joyful? You know what's just fun and easy, even in the context of Tabletop Simulator? Undaunted. Let's review Undaunted. Let's just have an excuse to play Undaunted a whole bunch more times, because that is a way to get me out of this terrible headspace. And I think that's the best testament that I can give to the game of Undaunted Normandy. I Sometimes the scenarios aren't necessarily to my liking. Sometimes the dice rolls can get wonky, because there are uh, sometimes a, a small number of high-consequence dice rolls. But to my mind, Undaunted Normandy and Undaunted North Africa, its follow-up, and Undaunted Reinforcements, which recently won the Golden Geek for the best war game of the year, congratulations... It's exactly what I wanted War Chest to be. They're very similar in a number of ways. You've got this deck building element that interacts with with a, a board position. And I think that in terms of an evolution of this idea, what can we have deck building do? I think that Undaunted is one of the best examples of that idea pretty much ever done. It's a brilliant system, and I, I love it every time I go back to it. It's such a joy. So we've been going in chronological order so far. So let's just Well, keep our chronology anyway. Ours, but it has been also in, in his chronology for the games that we've talked about anyway. So next up is Switch and Signal. So his first uh, 
Switch and Signal was back in 2014. It was a print and play. That yeah, it was came, the first draft. Yeah, the first draft, and then he came back to it with Cosmos Games in this sort of pandemic atmosphere, this huge demand for solo games, and he put it out of the park again. It's this fantastic uh, a train game that feels like a train game. You're picking up, you're delivering, you're, you're uh, manipulating routes, trying to make the trains not smash into each other. You're under a timer. You're, you're risking, you know, fast trains and slow trains and worrying about where they're going to show up. Everything about Switch and Signal. I really enjoy. It's shockingly good. It based, it's one of those games that gets so much mileage out of an incredibly simple rule set. Am I thrilled at the fact that it, it's basically the same game, single player as it is multiplayer? Not necessarily. It, you know, again, it's, it's kind of like uh, uh, our complaints about Sniper Elite. More on that later. It's basically a fixed. There, there's a fixed amount of game to be had, and if you're playing with multiple players, you're just divvying it up. But I had a, I had a lot of fun playing multiplayer, nonetheless, because you get that added level of discussion about what to, what's to be done. It's it, it surprised me completely because. Because one of the reasons why David Thompson, I think, is worthy of this kind of spotlight, in addition to the relentlessly consistent quality of excellence of the games that he has produced, either alone and with co-designers, but it's also because I never know what he's going to release next. He comes from a war game background. You know, whether it's the original inspiration of some of his games, more on that later, inspired by things like Final Fantasy Tactics or A Few Acres of Snow. And he he's released a number of historical war games, more on those later. I was not expecting a cooperative train game out of it. Like, it's not the kind of thing that I was expecting. It's true. And I do have a, a, a quick note that I have to make. It wasn't the... Uh, Few Acres Snow definitely was motivated by uh, Undaunted Normandy, but the older design that he went back to was For What Remains. And that was the next game that was out that I've had uh, games of. So What For Remains is a, is a skirmishing game where you're pulling tokens out of a bag much like a war chest or, you know, sort of, you know, you can well, see... Well, it's a, a chip-pull activation system. Chip-pull activation. a very venerable wargaming activation system. And, and just, like I said, he takes that skirmish genre and he and he simplifies it down. He takes out all the fiddliness. It's, it's simple line of sight, simple wound system. Everything about it. I can't wait to play more. Tons of factions. Can't wait till you get back so we can put this on the table more often. So when... For What Remains was a co-design with Paul Lowe and Ricardo Manuel Luis Tomas. And one of the things that I think is is truly striking about For What Remains is the degree to which it really makes the chit-pull activation system sing. Uh, it, it influences army composition. It influences your overall tactics because any given unit can only activate three times over the course of two turns. And so you can't just always focus on your heavy bruisers. You have to be worried about where you're going to be leaving people exposed. And of course, like every other skirmish game, there are special abilities to be had and they work really well. But on top of that, I, I was thinking about it and outside of the tabletop wargaming sphere, because tabletop wargaming has had a number of uh, very, very good innovations in the miniatures game sphere for solo play over the course of the past few years. Gee, I wonder why. Outside of that, I have to say that the solo AI version in For What Remains is the best board gaming solo AI I have ever seen for anything. It is marvelously easy to execute, but at the same time provides you a very consistent and engaging challenge that feels like playing the normal game. And that's one of the reasons why I've played For What Remains as much as I have. I've played a lot of it, uh, and the majority of it has been solo because I love skirmish gaming. And I love skirmish tabletop wargaming in, with, with miniatures, but you know, the setup and the teardown, it's a little bit painful and you're going to be, it's a consistent investment. But For What Remains was a lovely way to get that same fix. Uh, it's one of my favorite David Thompson designs, which is saying quite a lot. And this, this is the game that I was talking about that he was originally inspired by Final Fantasy Tactics. And as a, a, a big fan of that game back in the day, I can definitely see the lineage. I can definitely see the inspiration. And it's, it's, it, it's a tremendous game. And it's a shame that it doesn't get more exposure. I have to think that partially because it's published by a historical wargaming company. You know, every time a historical wargaming company publishes a game that isn't a historical wargame, you're talking about a very, very niche appeal. It was also distributed in a way that was kind of expensive. If you want the whole set, you need three boxes, which is kind of a lot of money. But I on I absolutely think it's worth it for what remains as a triumph. Agreed. So let's just talk a little bit about that because there's a big difference between a, a solo game and a solo mode. Yes. So David Thompson 
uh, designs a lot of solo games, games that are designed uh, designed for only one person. Whereas a lot of his games have a solo mode, which you'll see very often are not designed by David Thompson. Yes, indeed. So on that topic, we should probably talk about the Valiant Defense series. The aforementioned Pavlov's House, Castle Itter, which was published afterwards, but I, I understand was designed earlier. And the most recent Soldiers and Postmen's uniforms, which we reviewed not too long ago and made it into both our top tens, as I recall, of the year. And I've played all of them. They've all been really excellent. <laughs> and like, like, like everything else with David Thompson... Uh, well, unlike a lot of other things with David Thompson, these were not co-designs. He, there are no co-designers with any of those three. He is going to be releasing a follow-up in the next game in the Valiant Defense series called Lanzarath Ridge, which unfortunately is about the Battle of the Bulge. And I, I say that only because every, every war game system eventually goes to the Battle of the Bulge. A uh, little bit of an eye roll, but that, that's neither here nor there. And they're incredibly stripped down, but never simplistic. And honestly, if there if there was a touchstone of David Thompson designs, that would have to be it. Incredibly simple, but never simplistic. No, and you can see in all of these historical pieces that he that he's designed, it's never about the overall arc of a of an entire battle or an entire section. It's usually always one day or two days of a specific battle at a specific place. Well, like kind you say of. I mean, you say Pavlov's house is a bit of an exception. Right, because and that's what I love about Pavlov's house so much. You have the zoomed out strategic view. You have to worry about supply. You have to worry about anti-air capability and all those other things. But it's zoomed wow. into the eponymous Pavlov's house, the specific apartment wow. building, the specific apartment building, and you end up focusing on the specific men at that specific place in that specific time. And it's that juxtaposition of the strategic and the tactical and the seamless way that you go back and forth that it really makes Pavlov's House sing. And it's probably why all told it's my favorite of, his, of, of that series. It's available on Steam. People should try it on Steam yeah. if they don't want to get the physical I keep, game. I keep forgetting that, that I definitely want to give it a try there. But I do agree with you with respect to Castle Itter and uh, soldiers and postmen's uniforms. It's that sense of specificity, that historical engagement that you might not have ever heard of, that nonetheless has shocking echoes of broader geopolitical concerns. We talked about this in our review of soldiers and postmen's uniforms. Castle Itter, despite being a strange engagement where members of an American tank corps allied with an SS officer and a French tennis star nonetheless tells you a little bit about how the war wound down. Similarly, soldiers and postmen's uniforms tells you a little bit about the legal architecture surrounding the initial days of the German invasion and occupation of various countries. They're very well evocative and it should be, it should be stressed as well. David Thompson in, in a lot of these games, including for Reigns, but definitely in all the Valiant Defense series, has historical background books available for download on his website that are very much worth a read. Uh, for What Remains is a little less with the historical and a little bit more with the fiction, but you know. <laughs> so there's been a bunch of expansions for Undaunted Normandy, sorry, for Undaunted that we didn't talk about, but it's more of the same in some cases. And then the next thing I have here is Sniper Elite. Did you want to add any others in there before we get to Sniper Elite? I would like to give a shout out to a couple of other designs that I've tried. Europe Divided, which he co-designed with Chris Marling. I never played Europe Divided as much as I wanted to. I only played it a couple of times. It is an asymmetric card game about the struggles between NATO and the Russian Federation. Not that that's in any way historically relevant right now at all. And I, it, it plays with deck building again, and it was a little bit strange uh, in a little bit counterintuitive in terms of what you wanted to add to your deck and when, so I'd like to go back to that. And also by Stealth and Sea, which he co-delined with N Nicholas Sagini, and this also is a solo historical war game, which again has a focus on a very strange, underappreciated, or at least understudied area of the Second World War, where a whole bunch of Italian frogmen basically rode mini submarine missiles in an attempt to destroy. It's a strange game. It's basically a, a, a kind of a roll and write where you're just constantly chucking dice to try to fix this absurd contraption that is that, that you're straddled onto, and usually failing, and then sailing off in the middle of nowhere. It's surprisingly engaging from a narrative perspective, if not from a gameplay perspective. And so that's another uh, solo historical war game he designed. So then on to Sniper Elite, the board game. And I just wanted to make sure it's clear that all of the negative things we said about the video game, none of that is in the board 100%. game 100%. And in point of fact, 
it's worth emphasizing, a number of people have complained on Board Game Geek. It's like, oh, for a game called Sniper Elite, you don't shoot very much. It's like, it's true. There's not a whole lot of violence in Sniper Elite, the board game, as compared to the video game. <laughs> in comparison, for sure. The, the violence level is brought down one or two notches. Yeah, a little bit. A hundred notches. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure what else to say. They, he takes... He takes what is uh, spec ops, alts, and you know all of these other sort of hidden fury of Dracula, fury of Dracula Scotland Yard, hidden roll like movement, and just and and boils it down into something that's very fun, very easy to teach, very easy to understand, hard to mess up as less pressure for the one v all, which which I agree with you. I don't know. Maybe it has a whole different feel because we played it three player. Yes. And then the two player playing the Germans, I really did feel that we were playing like as a team. Yes. And I, I didn't feel there was too much quarterbacking or, or it was a problem. None. Right. And I can see where if you, if we had another player, how it would easily break down into everyone had their squad. They would do what they do. I'm, and maybe there would be a little bit of no, maybe you should move these guys here. But I, I really feel as though it would be minimal. There would be, you know, I'm going to block off this. I'm going to make sure these particular objectives are covered because it has that very key uh, mechanism where the sniper cannot move into a space where a German is. So it's it's very interesting how you can block off parts of the map, how you can protect doorways, how you can protect objectives. For groups that complain about quarterbacking or the alpha gamer problem, I could not recommend either Switch and Signal or Sniper Elite. Because I think that they would probably have those issues. We honestly almost never have those issues. And so I'm not surprised that we didn't. But when it comes to Sniper Elite and Switch and Signal, there's no, there are no forced communication restrictions. There's no sense of particular ownership over things. Maybe if we all had our own notional squads in Sniper Elite, we would have a kind of sense of ownership. And this, you know, these are my people. And so I do what I want with these people. And I'm going to play my section of the board. I don't know. Tough to tell. But as I say, one of the unfortunate aspects of Sniper Elite is it, it feels like a two player game where as you add more players, each player just has less to do. But that collaborative aspect does add a different social dynamic. And we did have a few issues with the sort of giant thick lines because the map is divided into three sections, which are the three sort of patrol zones of the three German units and sort of where they meet. There's these giant, you know, red and yellow lines buffed up against each other. And sometimes it looks as though it's unpassable. The German, uh, the sniper player did sometimes think. Yeah, uh, once I think. Once he thought one of the areas was not passable just because of the way the board looked. But I think in the next play, it would be. You know, that that problem well, would be immediately gone. As com I remember when we played Spectre Ops, I've, I've only played Spectre Ops the once, and I jumped into a game where every other player at the table had played Spectre Ops at least once, some of them several times, and they had far more confusion about the map and how line of sight works and who could do what when and who got spotted at what time than we had in our very first game of Sniper Elite. And so the fact that, yes, there was one minor bit of confusion about the way this particular thing was graphically represented pales in comparison. Again, the soul of simplicity, but never feeling simplistic. And this, which which is unusual, because you talked about a, a, a few acres of snow, which, which I think is telling, because Martin Wallace is another game designer who's basically got one foot in the historical war game community and another foot in sort of the modern hobbyist market. And his games are always a little more Baroque than they need to be, a little bit more convoluted than they should, a little bit, too, a few too many rough edges. David Thompson games do not suffer from this at all. And so I mean, his games, especially in the context of historical war games, are heads and shoulders above other historical war games in terms of how clean and approachable and how engaging they are in terms of rules minimalism. But the fact that his broader market hobby stuff is still simpler than a lot of the, a lot of other competitors and yet offering you the, the same or greater level of evocation and immersion and quality decision making is, I think, an, uh, is ultimately the testament to his genius and his design style. True, and it even goes down to the special abilities that the Germans have because it's not these outlandish things that bring up new rules or break the rules. It's sort of just a modification of abilities they already have. They shoot a little bit better. They move a little bit, bit better. They sort of make it so you don't take as many hits. So there's n none of this, you know, ha-ha moment or you forgot that I had this, you know, crazy ability. So I love all that. And, and we should stress in the context of Sniper Elite that he co-designed it with Roger Tankersley. 
Fun story. Roger Tankersley was an intern uh, uh, with Paul Gross at one point. Paul Gross was in Tremors with Kevin Bacon. I joke because sooner or later, I think the number of collaborations this guy has, I think he might become the Kevin Bacon of the board game world. So is there a David Thompson design that you haven't played that you're looking forward to trying? Uh, Well, there's the ones that are coming out soon because he did some games from... Uh, 2017 and earlier, like Orc Olympics and a couple of other things. I saw Orc Olympics was going to be something well, that I had talked Okay, about. so Orc Olympics, he co-designed with Trevor Benjamin. I'd certainly be willing to play it. I have no idea. Like, the thing is, I constantly underestimate the man. Here's the thing. I should know better by now, right? I it's always, Every time, it's like, oh, geez, I don't know about this one this time. It always turns out to be delightful. And I've seen Armageddon in many places. Yeah, he it, also designed it, Armageddon. It's a, it's a Queen's game. The production is is amazing, and so I definitely want to give it a try. And the, so the theme... A number know. of people bounced off of it because there's a serious disconnect between the way the game presents itself and the way the game plays. Apparently, it's a pretty straightforward Euro with trappings of non-Euro, and a number of people reacted badly to that. This, I don't think, is the kind of problem that we might have. Because uh, those often are the kinds of games we gravitate towards sometimes. I, I could certainly be willing to try them, but mostly in terms of my excitement is his future output. I've already talked about Lanzarath Ridge, which is the next game in the Valiant Defense series. Uh, Resist, which is on GameFind right now, which he co-designed with Trevor Benjamin and Roger Tankersley, two people he's collaborated with before. And Dire Alliance, which is currently in limbo in China, uh, which has a solo mode designed by the Sadler brothers, and he co-designed it with Trevor Benjamin. And the game on P500 right now with GMT, I think this is his first uh, GMT design, uh, Zheng Ha with Jeff Engelstein. Jeff Engelstein, also a a great designer in his own right. And that's the solo game about the merchant and uh, uh, merchant naval voyages of of Zheng Ha. So I'm, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to all of those. So the, there are only two things I think that I can really generalize across his body of work. One of them is frequent co-designs, and the other is simple rule set, immer- lots of quality emergent gameplay. And that's definitely where you want to be. I mean, it beats the alternative of overloaded rules and not enough gameplay. It's the antithesis of burn cycle, right? You know, <laughs> the direct opposite. Streamlined. I'd rather go with streamlined than simple. I don't, to me, simple doesn't have a negative connotation. By the standards of hobby games, a lot of his games are very simple. True. But sure, streamlined is probably a better term for it. And uh, most of these designs that we've talked about, we've talked about a lot of different designs. Most of them were published over the course of the past three years. And he's going to be publishing, if the calendars are to be believed, he's going to have three more games in the next year. He's a busy man. He's a busy man. In 2020, he tried to, which which probably has his densest year of publication. Like, well, you know, I've had a lot of things in the in the in the hopper for a long time that just came out. It's just an accident. It's just it's just this is just a fluke. I'm like, yeah, you only get to pull the fluke card a couple times every decade, Mister Thompson. At this point, I'm beginning to suspect that there's a simpler explanation for why you have a list of publications as long as my arm, and all of them are great. Anyway, anyway. That is our designer spotlight of David Thompson. And that's going to do it for this week. Thank you very, very much for joining us for So Very Wrong About Games. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can find all our contact information on our website at sowronggames.com slash contact. We read everything you send us, and we'll get back to you if we can. Thank you very, very much again for tuning in. We sincerely appreciate it, and we hope to see you again soon. Peace! Thank you, listeners, for joining us for another installment of Swag Presents Masterpiece Theater in honor of His Grace, the Reverend Dr. Dr. Vincent, Duke of Diesel, Esquire OBE, whose name we will be slandering and shaming by virtue of his association of the thing we will be talking about this week, courtesy of Michael Walker, which is the Pentaveret Walker. Why, Walker, why? Because, Mark, it is the kind of comedy that sings to me. <laughs> Michael Myers is a Canadian actor. And this is very, and to me, some people might not feel this way, but to me, it's very much a South Park type of humor. They, they do, they talk about things that are very silly and very foolish. So do we. But, but in reality, (laughs) they are, they're inferring other things that, that. Implying. Implying many other things that the, the people might not pick up on. I literally cannot remember the last time I saw something this bad. I'm having difficulty try, r- trying to recall. It's been years, at least. No, let's, let's be clear. Mark only watched the first episode. I watched all of that first episode, and it felt like five years of my life. Oh, my goodness. Can I, can, I, can, I, can I say something slightly serious for a while? You sure can. 
there is a certain Canadian attitude of smug condescension that is expressed in the in in the pentaverate and has been very very prevalent recently in the reaction by both elected officials and broader culture to many of the things happening in the United States of America over the course of the past couple of years, right? Oh, we're so much better. We don't have those issues. We're Canadians. Our biggest problem is that we're not... Nonsense. We export white supremacy to the United States of America. We have extremist violence in our country as well. We had somebody shoot up a mosque in Quebec not too long ago. The Quebec government is trying to persecute members of visible minorities. We have gun shootings all the time too. And so when I see crap like that shirt that the 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 the, the female lead, the the AV assistant wears, like living the American dream without the violence since 1867, that is honestly an expression of smug, hypocritical condescension that is completely unwarranted. We have a mass casualty incident studying the mass murder in Porta Peak, where it seriously looks like the Royal Canadian Mounted Police suppressed evidence of an ongoing mass shooting because they were embarrassed because the guy was working for them previously. Well, we don't know for sure. We don't have the full records. I'm not. I, I'm left to be conspiracist because the RCMP have been actively lying to us for years. They warned their family members that there was a shooter on the loose, and at the same time told no one in the public that anything was awry. We have police misconduct. We have guns here too. We have all of that same crap. We like to pretend we're better than that, but we're not. And it, I, I get so upset when people are like, oh, oh, we're, oh, poor Americans. They can't get their shit together. It's like, oh, for fuck's sake. Mark, they only have a two-party system. I'm not. <laughs> I, well, I, <laughs> there are, there are ways in which I think we as Canadians can claim to be better off or that we've kind of figured some things out. Maybe slightly better than the way the American. I'm. I will be the first to do that. No, not, I don't, but this I don't re- want to put it in the thing. It's not better. It's just different. <sighs> well, okay, whatever. Setting all that aside, I think there's a happy medium between. Oh, the thing about Canada is we're just too nice and kind of soft and silly. Nothing bad ever happens in Canada. Everything's perfect here, and there's no difference between the U.S. and Canada. We're both just as as messed up in the exact same ways. I think there's a middle part there, but the part where we get to pat ourselves on the back for being the version of ourselves that Mike Myers is selling to the U.S., it honestly is starting to make me angry. And the same thing happened in... Board gaming hook. The same thing happened in Omicron Protocol. One of the characters in Omicron Protocol is a French Canadian member of the Mounted Police. And they talk about how he's always just this nice guy who wants to go help people. That's fine. You could have cops be good people. I'm not going to insist that you have to have all, like, every cop represented in games has to be it's like, well, you know, he shot three black kids on the way to work. No, I'm not saying that. But the Royal Canadian Mounted Police were established as an irregular light cavalry rev- uh, regiment exclusively for the purpose of suppressing and containing indigenous people. That is why they were found. That was their purpose and their existence. And as I said, they're in, currently involved in any number of... Se- okay, sorry, sorry. The Pentaverit. And that is the silly comedy, The Pentaverit. But do you want to know where I'm coming from? The Pentaverit is trafficking in a certain image of Canada that I think is now downright offensive. It is simultaneously a, it is simultaneously insulting that oh we're just kind of soft and slow and, and and overly polite. I think that's not giving us enough credit, and it is giving us too much credit by implying that we're just some sort of halcyon civilized utopia right next door to some savage borderland. But, but isn't that what they're? It, don't you think that is what they're saying? Didn't you see the part where they go into where Canada's fuzzy and and America is in high definition? That you know people. Think I think they're giving you too much credit. I don't. <sighs> I think this is the sniper elite problem. It could be satire of that view, but I don't think that's what it's doing. I think it's just that people think it's these two different places. Like, oh look, it's like this is the same shtick that Myers has but, been doing for a very long time, and his humor has not evolved past uh, Bob and Doug McKenzie. It's the same stuff since Bob and Doug McKenzie. Not even 30 years. What, that's 50 years almost? Bob, and, You don't know Bob and Doug McKenzie? I do, but how does Mike Myers tie into that? It's the same old stuff. It's the same set of Canadian stereotypes. Oh, oh, I see. I thought you meant he was like part of that. No, no, no. He wasn't oh, part of that okay. crew, but it's, it's, okay. the, it's the same through line. Gotcha, gotcha. And Bob and Doug McKenzie was itself a joke about Canadian stereotypes. Yes. And it instead became the Canadian stereotype. How messed up is that? It started when CBC went and told the people at SCTV, oh, you need an extra two minutes because we we cut our commercials different here. Put something Canadian content. And like Rick Moranis and other people like, we're Canadians on a Canadian network telling jokes. It's all Canadian content. What do you want us to do? Have a skit where we drink beer and talk, talk about hockey? And and so that was their middle finger to the CBC. That's what Bob and Doug McKenzie was. Coo, 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 coo. Yeah, exactly. But now it, it the joke has become so insidious 
Anyway, I have a lot of thoughts. Most of them are about how the Pentabrit is terrible. So, see, don't you like shows that that inspire such thoughts, such passion? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so the Pentabrit is about this silly secret organization that controls the world, but they're nice guys, and they're trying to work on on global heating. Anyway, silly stuff ensues. Give it a try. So Mike Myers dresses up in like 12 different outfits. He does. And the main character is a reporter at a local Toronto station. The call sign of the Toronto station is C-A-C-A. Do you get it? The call sign is Kaka. Do you get it? Kaka like poo. Do you get the joke? Do you get it? Do you see how funny that is? Oh, boy. Because news stations put out crap. <laughs> That, I'm sure that was the first draft of his joke, right? It's like, hmm, he works for CRAP. No, that's a little too on the nose. Let's make it. Let's make it a little subtler and make it C A C A. It's French. <laughs> <laughs> you Walker have been funnier over the course of this broadcast <laughs> than Mike Myers, who, like, on the topic of wastes of money, let's call this the burn cycle thread, because like, the production values are pretty high. Do you know how much money this? Yeah. Product? It, it honestly, as I was watching it while I was desperately trying to find something to engage my mind because what was on the screen wasn't doing it, I got a little bit depressed about how much money this probably represents a waste of. I am agreeing with that. But it's nice to have things that are different for a change than having the same old, you know, overly produced sci- science fiction, you know, rehash of a story. It's nice to have something original for a change. It is not a Marvel movie. You're right. Exactly. Thank you, listeners, for joining us for Swag Presents Masterpiece Theater and Mark Rants About Police. <laughs> bye bye. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>